At one time or another, most of us have felt trapped by things we find ourselves thinking or doing, caught by our own impulses, ensnared in some unhappiness or fear, imprisoned by our own history. His doctor's letter described him as a pathological liar. Could I offer an assessment? Maybe see him for psychotherapy? Philip came to see me for an interview one April, some years ago. His doctor had decided to refer him after bumping into Philip's wife at a local bookshop. She'd taken his hand, holding back tears. Would it be a good idea, she'd wondered, for them to discuss the remaining treatment options for Philip's lung cancer? During his first meeting with me, Philip, who was perfectly healthy, as his GP had told me, listed some of the lies he'd recently told. At a school fundraiser, he told his daughter's music teacher that he was the son of a famous composer, a man who was widely known to be unmarried and gay. Just before that, he told his father-in-law, a sports journalist, that he'd once been selected as a reserve for the UK men's archery team. The first lie he could remember telling was to a classmate. When Philip was 11 or 12, he'd insisted that he'd been recruited by MI5 to train as an agent. He described his headmaster's admonishment. For goodness sake, if you're going to lie, at least do a better job of it. The headmaster was right. Philip was a dreadful liar. While each lie seemed tailored to wow the listener, they were also pointlessly excessive, wildly risky. You don't seem to worry about people thinking you're a liar, I told him. He shrugged. He told me that his listeners rarely challenged him. His wife did not confront him about his miraculous recovery, just as she had seemed to accept the news of his cancer. Others, like his father-in-law, were almost certainly more sceptical, but also remained silent. When I asked him about the effect his lying had on his career, he worked as a television producer, he told me that everyone in the industry lied. It's part of the skill set. As far as I could tell, Philip didn't empathize with the people to whom he had lied. For the most part, he just didn't seem to care. That is, until the week before he came to see me. His seven-year-old daughter had asked for his help with her French homework. He'd always told her that he was fluent. Now, instead of admitting that he didn't speak French, he told her that he just couldn't remember the names of the farm animals in her exercise book. She became silent and looked away. He saw her realize that he had lied to her. Throughout the consultation, I was struck by Philip's frankness but I knew that if he was to be himself with me, if he was to bring all of himself into our work, he would, at some point, lie to me. It happened soon enough. A month into treatment, he stopped paying his bill. He told me that he'd misplaced his checkbook, but that he would settle his account as soon as he found it. The next month, he told me he had donated his month's salary to the Freud Museum. After five months of tall tales, I had to inform him that we would stop at the end of that month unless he settled his debt. Just as he was about to leave what was to have been our final session, he took a check from his pocket and handed it to me. I was relieved to be paid, but uncertain about what had happened between us. Philip had told increasingly blatant lies, and I would become increasingly withdrawn, more guarded when I spoke. He was, I now realized, expert in tying his listener up in the social convention that we meet lies with polite silence. But why? What possible psychological purpose could his behavior serve? We wrestled with this question for the next year of his treatment. We explored the idea that his lying was a way of controlling others or compensating for a sense of inferiority. We talked about his parents. His father was a surgeon, and his mother had been a schoolteacher until her death just before Philip's twelfth birthday. And then, one day, 
Philip described a memory from childhood which had seemed too trivial to mention until then. From the age of three, he used to share a bedroom with his twin brothers, who slept in cots nearby. He sometimes woke in the middle of the night to the sounds of people shouting as they left the pub across the road. He was often aware of a need to pee, and knew that he should get up and walk down the hall, but he would stay in bed, motionless. I used to wet my bed as a child, Philip told me. He described crumpling up his damp pajamas and pushing them deep into the covers, only to find them at bedtime, under his pillow, washed and neatly folded. He never discussed it with his mother, and to the best of his knowledge, she never told anyone, including his father, about his bedwetting. He'd have been furious with me, Philip said. I guess she thought I'd outgrow it. And I did when she died. Philip could not remember being alone with his mother. For most of his childhood, she had been busy taking care of the twins. He had no memory of ever talking with her on his own. One of his brothers or his father, someone was always there. His bedwetting and her silence gradually developed into a private conversation, something only they shared. When his mother died, this conversation abruptly came to an end. And so Philip began to improvise another version of their exchange. He told lies that would make a mess and then hoped that his listener would say nothing, becoming, like his mother, a partner in a secret world. Philip's lying was not an attack upon intimacy, though it sometimes had that effect. It was his way of keeping the closeness he had known, his way of holding on to his mother. flight from New York to San Francisco, settling into my seat, I find I'm sharing the role with an attractive, well-dressed woman. She has the window, I have the aisle. The seat between us is empty. I volunteer to move so her two boys, who are in the next row over, could join her. She laughs and tells me that I clearly don't have teenage kids. They'd prefer to be sitting even further away. She asks about me. I ask about her. I ask if she's going on vacation. No, she tells me, she's on her way to visit her mum. She adjusts her necklace. It'll be the first time I've seen her in sixteen years, since my parents cut me out of their lives. Her comment has the effect I think she wants it to have. I want to know what happened. Abby tells me that, eighteen years earlier, she met a guy named Patrick. They were medical students together. Although she was Jewish and he was Catholic, she believed that her parents would eventually come to accept him. My family was never particularly observant, and Patrick is really someone special. Abby's dad, who is also a doctor, was extremely upset by the idea of her blonde boyfriend. He made terrible racist comments about Patrick. When Abby and Patrick became engaged, he told her that if she actually went ahead and married him, he'd have nothing more to do with her. He told her he'd sit Shiva, go into mourning. I don't know if he actually sat Shiva, but on the day I married Patrick, he stopped speaking to me. As usual, her mother followed her father's lead. For several years, Abby sent birthday cards and Hanukkah presents to her parents, but after the birth of her first child... When they didn't respond to the birth announcement, she just gave up. There were times, especially during the first years of her marriage, when she thought she was going crazy. Whenever she and Patrick had an argument, she found herself thinking that she should have married someone more like her, someone Jewish. Maybe her dad was right. She talked to a psychotherapist about all this, but that hadn't really helped. We couldn't make sense of what had happened. Was my dad jealous of Patrick? Jealous of me? His behavior made no sense at all. Then, out of the blue, a couple of months ago, I get a call from my mom, 
telling me that she and my dad are getting a divorce. My mum's discovered that he's been having an affair with Cathy, his receptionist. She's worked for my dad for 25 years. Apparently, they've been having an affair since I graduated from high school. Surprise, surprise, Cathy is Catholic and blonde. And then I got it, Abby says. The bigger the front, the bigger the back. Psychoanalysts call this splitting, an unconscious strategy that aims to keep us ignorant of feelings in ourselves that we're unable to tolerate. Typically, we want to see ourselves as good and put those aspects of ourselves that we find shameful into another person or group. Splitting is one way we have of getting rid of self-knowledge. When Abby's father cut her off, he was trying to cut himself off from those hateful aspects of himself that he could not bear. In the short term, this gives us some relief. I'm not bad, you are. But in denying and projecting a part of ourselves into another, we come to regard these negative aspects as outside of our control. At its extreme, splitting renders the world an unsettling, even dangerous place. Rather than recognize his devils as his own, Abby's father meets them as if for the first time in his daughter. Imagine his predicament. It was unbearable for him to think that he'd fallen in love with someone outside of his religion. Able to locate the problem in Abby, he lost awareness of it in himself. He continues his affair with Kathy, but because he lacks an internal experience of his own feelings and actions, He's lost the best means he has of making sense of himself or his daughter. I like Abby's phrase, the bigger the front, the bigger the back. It's more telling than the psychoanalytic term. Splitting is thinner, less dynamic. It suggests two separate, disjointed things. Abby's saying captures the fact that front and back are a part of each other. Ever since hearing Abby's story, whenever I hear about a family values politician who's caught with his pants down, or some homosexuality is a sin evangelist found in bed with a male prostitute, I think, the bigger the front, the bigger the back.